It's October 30th here in Seoul, and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories, making the headlines at this hour. Starting with North Korea's deployment of troops to Russia. The U.S. has also confirmed a small number of North Korean soldiers are already in Russia's Kursk region, while a Lithuanian NGO says some North Korean troops were killed in a clash last week. And the leaders of South Korea and Ukraine agreed to step up their country's cooperation and seek strategic countermeasures under North's troop deployment as well as a deepening Pyongyang-Moscow military relations. Bitcoin price arose as high as $73,000 on Tuesday, driven by growing bets on a Republican victory in the U.S. presidential election next week. Following South Korea and NATO's confirmation, the U.S. has also acknowledged North Korean soldiers' presence in Russia's Kursk region. Our E&E leads us this morning. The U.S. government confirmed on Tuesday that a couple of thousand North Korean troops are moving toward Russia's Kursk region, with a small unit already present there. We are concerned that they do intend to employ these forces in combat against uh, the Ukrainians, or at least support combat. Uh, operations against the Ukrainians in the Kursk region. This follows an earlier claim by the Lithuanian NGO Blue Yellow, which has been assisting Ukrainian troops that the first encounter between the Ukrainian troops and North Korean military forces occurred on October 25th in Russia's Kursk region, leading to the death of all but one North Korean. U.S. President Joe Biden on Tuesday also expressed concerns about the presence of North Korean troops in Russia, stating that if they cross into Ukraine, Ukraine should respond with force. On the same day, State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller criticized Russia and North Korea, stating that the deployment of North Korean troops marks a significant escalation in the DPRK's ongoing involvement in Russia's illegal actions and another breach of UN Security Council resolutions. Meanwhile, NATO Secretary General Mark Rutha and President of the European Commission Ursula von der Leyen agreed that the actions of Russia and North Korea signify a major escalation in the war against Ukraine, posing serious threats to European security and global peace while emphasizing the importance of a close and strategic partnership between NATO and the EU. Russian President Vladimir Putin on Tuesday kicked off a military exercise of the country's nuclear forces, simulating a retaliatory strike. According to reports in a video call with military leaders, he explained that the drills would practice the use of nuclear weapons, including launches of ballistic and cruise missiles. Russia's defense minister reported that the drill was to practice its strategic offensive forces launching a massive nuclear strike in response to a nuclear strike by the enemy. Amid intensified global tensions, South Korea and the United States will hold the 56th Security Consultative Meeting at the Pentagon on Wednesday local time, focusing this year on the implications of North Korean troop deployments to Russia. Yoon Hee, Arirang News. President Yoon suk yeol and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky agreed to tighten their coordination on countermeasures and an action strategy over the North troop deployment. According to South Korea's presidential office, the two leaders held a phone talks on Tuesday, where Yoon said that his country will not sit idly by as Pyongyang and Moscow's military work together. Zelensky said the two sides agreed to strengthen intelligence and expert exchanges. According to the Ukrainian leader, a special envoy to South Korea will be appointed with a mission to carry out strategic cooperation between the two countries. Now, about these uh, soldiers being stationed in Russia, SARS spy agency believes uh, many of these uh, dispatched troops appear to be as young as in their late teens. Our Kim jong sil has the details. The National Intelligence Service has provided an update on North Korea's troop deployment to Russia. In a closed-door briefing to the National Assembly Intelligence Committee on Tuesday, the NIS reported on ongoing troop transfers to Russia, including the potential movement of senior officers to the front lines. The NIS also gave details particularly regarding soldiers seen in recent videos. In North Korea, the age for military service starts at 18. So some of the soldiers included in the recent deployment to the Storm Corps are in their late teens, with most being in their early 20s. While they may appear young, it's important to note that these soldiers have already undergone the basic combat training required for their roles, so we shouldn't underestimate their combat capabilities. 
The Storm Corps is known to be one of North Korea's elite special forces units. However, the NIS pointed out that the unfamiliar terrain of modern warfare, as seen in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, presents challenges for these North Korean troops who lack experience in such conflicts. The officials then added that it's still hard to tell the exact number of troops being moved to the Kursk region, but that the total number of deployment is being estimated at around 10,900. The NIS also disclosed that Russian forces have been teaching over 100 military terms to North Korean troops, terms such as on your mark and fire. However, reports indicate communication problems as many North Korean soldiers are struggling with the Russian language. The NIS also warned of possible upcoming provocations by North Korea. North Korea is preparing to launch a new reconnaissance satellite, reportedly resolving technical issues from a failed attempt in May with assistance from Russia. While the situation remains fluid, there are indications the North may consider a seventh nuclear test after the U.S. presidential election. North Korea and Russia are reportedly also ramping up economic cooperation, especially in minerals, with covert deals likely to bypass sanctions after signing a new partnership treaty in June. NIS estimates that over 4,000 North Korean workers have been sent to Russia this year. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. With a continued international focus on military ties between Pyongyang and Moscow, North Korea's top diplomat is making yet another visit to Moscow to further tighten relations. We're joined by Professor Song Sirun this morning. Good morning. Good morning. So North Korea's foreign minister, that is Choi son making her second trip to Russia in six weeks. Would you say her trip is about the North Korean trip transfer? I think so. There is a uh, that is a very significant uh, development for Korea, uh, for North Korea. I think it has uh, many different reasons to do it. One is that North Korea is an isolated country. They always want a a backing or alignment with a stronger, a bigger company, a bigger country, and Russia fits the bill. Mm. And I think there is another reason that the Kim Jong Un wants uh, the North Korea to align with the russia at this point is for domestic reasons he wants to show the north korean people that north korea is active in the international stage and aligning with russia can send a message uh, that is beneficial to his leadership well then why is the north making her trip all public is it to show off uh, i i think it is noteworthy it's it's a spotlight and he wants to make it a official for the, not only for Russia, but for uh, North Korean people, because it has to be an important news item uh, to have the message in fact. I think that also uh, the Russia cannot back out on it uh, because of this uh, high uh, the profile uh, meeting with the, the leaders between the two countries. Well, on top of that, what we are also learning is that North Korean soldiers are being trained and also they're learning Russian military terms. Uh, do you think this means these, these soldiers will be there for you know, an extended period of time? I mean, until the war ends, possibly? Well, on one hand, uh, the foreign land, maybe they need the, uh, the, the travel phraseology. Uh, but I think we cannot rule out the possibility that uh, instead of isolated uh, units uh, fighting there, they, there, there is a possibility that they will be folded into a strategic formation of the Russian uh, military assault. So that means, as you said, uh, there is a possibility that they'll be there for duration, and the learning the language it seems like a, a natural first step. Well, what we also do know that is at, at least 10,000 troops are uh, in Kursk region to fight against Ukraine. The question is, is 10,000 enough to make a difference in the fight against Ukraine? What do you think? Well, it depends on the situation. If we consider that there are about 50,000 Russian soldiers in Kursk, uh, 10,000 uh, is about 20 uh, percent of that uh, troop. So it's a significant number in that uh, isolated uh, locale. Mm. So I, I think it is a, a significant move. And if, it, if they can make uh, some kind of headway into and make some uh, notable achievement in a military front, uh, probably that will send a strong message to uh, Russian leadership and the North Korean people 
then this Thai military tie is a significant one. Well, what some experts are saying that North Korea is uh, making Russia owe North big time by sending its soldiers to Russia. Is that so? What's your take on it, Professor Song? I think we look back upon what happened in Vietnam. Uh, South Korea went, uh, sent the troops, and it, it was beneficial for two countries. And North Korea probably looking for the same kind of uh, quid pro quo kind of relationship where they, they could uh, be led into getting uh, more military, advanced military technologies or economic or diplomatic uh, backing uh, and cover. Uh, so th those kind of things are very crucial for North Korea, which is very isolated and have been for a long time uh, uh, in this stage. Well, then let's do say that Russia owes North Korea big time. That what will the regime want in return? Well, uh, first of all, I, I think that that will bol uh, bolster the, the leadership of Kim Jong-un. Uh, but uh, more substantively, maybe military technology, economic aid, diplomatic support, strategic influence, those are uh, that something, something that the, the North Korea really wants at this point. Uh, again, the isolated situation has been prolonged, and in order to get some kind of headway out, uh, probably they need help. Uh, maybe it's not coming from uh, China as much as before, so Russia is a uh, natural next step where they want some kind of uh, help and alliance uh, among in the in the regional powers. Right, they will make sure to make that a win-win situation for both Moscow and Pyongyang. Professor Song, thank you so much for your insights. As always, we appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. As a former president, as a former U.S. president, Donald Trump looks to return to the Oval Office. His positive views on Bitcoin seemingly pushed the cryptocurrency toward a new all-time high. Our Yi Sing reports. Former president and Republican candidate Donald Trump has previously stated that he would support cryptocurrency, going as far as to say that the government under his administration would hold Bitcoin. And as the prospects of his return to the Oval Office increased, so has the price of Bitcoin. Bitcoin surpassed the 70,000 U.S. dollar mark for the first time in about four months on Tuesday and closed in on the all-time high of $73,800 before falling back to the $72,000 range. Dogecoin, which has been long promoted by Tesla CEO and Trump supporter Elon Musk, also saw its price jump. With little room for error and controversy that might prevent Trump from returning to the White House, the Trump camp has distanced itself from comedian Tony Hinchcliffe, who was one of the openers for the Republican candidates' rally in New York City's Madison Square Garden on Sunday. The comedian referred to Puerto Rico as a floating island of garbage, drawing massive criticism from Democrats and some Republicans as well. According to Trump campaign senior advisor Daniela Alvarez, the statement by Hinchcliffe does not reflect the views of Trump or the campaign. Trump has also seen a number of Republicans refusing to support him in his re-election bid. The daughter of former Republican President George W. Bush has now openly expressed her intent to support Democrat Kamala Harris. Barbara Pierce Bush joined the Harris campaign over the weekend in Pennsylvania in support for the Democratic candidate. Her endorsement comes as her parents have expressed no intention of endorsing either of the presidential candidates this year. Meanwhile, with former White House Chief of Staff John Kelly telling various media outlets that Trump had praised Hitler and Nazi Germany during his time as president, Trump's wife and former First Lady Melania Trump has come to defend her husband, saying he is not Hitler. Speaking to Fox and Friends on Tuesday, Melania pushed back against criticism of the former president. When asked why her husband is running for president again, she said he loves his country and the people and wants to make the U.S. great again. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. 
South Korea men's national football team captain Son Heung Min was named the Asian Football Confederation Asian International Player of the Year on Tuesday. Now, Son, who was not present, was given the honor during the AFC annual awards ceremony at Kyung University in Seoul. The captain of English Premier League side Tottenham Hotspur previously won the award in 2015, 2017, and 2019. The award is given to the top Asian player who plays outside the continent. Now, no other player has won the award more than once. Author Hang Gang owns a small bookstore that has been attracting quite a number of fans following her winning of this year's Nobel Prize for Literature, which is also revitalizing foot traffic at smaller bookshops. Ian Jin has more. This is an independent bookstore that Nobel Prize winning novelist Han Gang has been running for six years, despite it operating at a loss. She selects the books to display, stock, and share with the community personally, and also holds meetings with fellow writers. After her recent Nobel Prize for Literature, it has become a popular attraction. I heard the news of novelist Han Gang winning the Nobel Prize for Literature, so I ran here to congratulate her. Independent bookstores compete in the shadows of big chain bookstores, but they play an important role in introducing essential books and providing a space for reading groups, as well as preserving diversity in the publishing industry. The challenge is that selling books alone isn't enough to keep the small bookstores from operating at a deficit. Bookstores that are smaller than 100 square meters are difficult to maintain by just selling books. Owners often also run a cafe or bar business with the library to keep the bookstores afloat. Taking this into account, one large chain bookstore has decided to limit the sales of Hangang's books to a total of 2,000 books per day across eight of its branches. Instead, her books will be supplied first to small independent bookstores. This is in response to recent requests for a priority supply of Hangang's books due to fast depleting stocks. Even if it's temporary, if books in shortage are supplied at the smaller bookstores, it will greatly help revive them. In the long run, we need to discuss ways for the larger and smaller bookstores to coexist. Han Gang's achievement of winning the Nobel Prize in Literature, which led to her books quickly selling out, has created a positive win-win atmosphere for the big chain bookstores and independent bookstores for the first time in a long while. Yun Jin, Arirang News. Now, let's take a look at the stories from around the world with our Kim Xiong. Good morning, Xiong. Good morning, Dami. Let's begin today in the Middle East. Israel is continuing its attacks in Gaza and Lebanon. Tell us more. Now, that's right, Dami. Following Monday's attack in Lebanon that killed at least 60 people, Israel continued its airstrikes on Tuesday in Gaza and Lebanon. Gaza officials on Tuesday said that at least 109 Palestinians, including children, were killed by an Israeli airstrike overnight, which destroyed a five-story residential building in Beit Lahia in northern Gaza. U.S. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller said on Tuesday that the U.S. was deeply concerned by the loss of civilian life and that the report of at least 25 children killed in the attack was a horrifying result. Miller added that the latest Israeli airstrike is another reminder of why we need to see an end to this war. The Israel Defense Forces said that it was aware of the reports that civilians were harmed. Now, meanwhile, in Lebanon, Hezbollah named Naim Qassem as its new leader on Tuesday as a successor to Hassan Nasrallah, who was assassinated by Israel in September. Qasem has previously said that Iran-backed militant group was ready for a long battle against Israel. Now, Argentine state employees, led by the Association of State Workers, began a 36-hour strike on Tuesday to protest against layoffs, low wages and budget cuts by President Javier Millet's new government. The Association of State Workers, or ATE, which is Argentina's largest union of public employees, called for the protest, which began with a march from the obelisk of Buenos Aires in the country's capital to the Ministry of Deregulation and State Transformation. The group announced that the strike will include air, rail and subway workers in Buenos Aires, beginning midnight on Wednesday, while bus drivers will also join the protest from Thursday. 
the ATE is demanding that Millet's government prevent the state from being taken over by large business groups. Spanish footballer Rodri, who plays as a midfielder for Manchester City, has won the 2024 Men's Ballon d'Or, an award given to the best footballer football player in the world. 28-year-old Rodrigo Hernández Cascante, who goes by Rodri, won his first Ballon d'Or on Monday local time. The women's award went again to Aitana Bonmati, who held up her second consecutive Ballon d'Or féminin. Rodri saw his team win a fourth straight Premier League trophy last season and was named the best player at the UEFA European Championship this year, where Spain won the competition. Now, Brazilian Vinicius Jr., who plays for Real Madrid, was runner-up, and his Real teammate Jude Bellingham came third. Moving over to New York City's Times Square, where new installations have been made in preparations for the annual Day of the Dead celebrations. Three large colorful statues were set up in one of the busiest areas in, of Manhattan to represent a Dia, do, Dia de los Muertos, a Mexican holiday, where it is believed that the dead come back to earth to visit their loved ones. The Day of the Dead is traditionally celebrated over two days, November 1st to honor the passing of children and November 2nd to remember the adults. It's a breezier start to the day, with morning temperatures going down 2 degrees, lower than the same time yesterday. Although highs will rise a couple of degrees higher this afternoon, leading to wider gaps in readings today. But it's not only the capital, most parts are seeing roller coaster temperatures today. And you know, these big gaps in readings are causing dense fog in the morning, causing headaches for the drivers. Please drive with caution in the mornings. After cloudy skies and on and off wet conditions we had this week, we'll finally be under bright skies with the fresh autumn air. Seoul gets up to 20 degrees Celsius. Gwangju and Jeju will be topping out at 22 degrees. Great weather to spend some time outdoors to enjoy autumn colors. But so the provinces in Jeju will be rainy in the latter half of the week due to the indirect effect of Typhoon Kongrei, but the rest of the country will have warm and pleasant autumn weather through Sunday. Well, that's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. That's all we have at this hour. Thanks for watching.